Hello, I'm Barry Shaw, and this is The View from Israel. In recent days, we've repeatedly witnessed scenes of Jews under threat, whether in Paris, London, or even in the Texas synagogue. There's a need for Jews to individually and collectively to find the courage to be more outspoken and act against the threats they're increasingly experiencing. Anti-Semitic Israeli hatred is on the rise. These are not separate issues. They're a common hybrid hatred, which must be met by affirmative Jewishness and affirmative Zionism. It took 11 hours for the Beit Israel rabbi to realize that appeasing an Islamic extremist with a gun gets you nowhere. A rabbi who had spent his career leading his Jewish community in collaboration with the local Muslim community is a very fine thing. But at the end of the day, as they found out, in a seminal moment came when he had to throw a chair at an Islamic gunman to enable his congregation to escape with their lives when 11 hours of appeasement failed. His final act of affirmative Jewishness is what saved his congregation. This is something that, sadly, too many Israelis have experienced, both in military and in their civilian lives. Each of us experienced acts of affirmative Zionism. Defending Israel from those who want to harm us is an act of affirmative Jewishness. And no one expresses this more than today's special guest, Avner Abraham. Welcome to The View from Israel, Avner. Thank you very much. And for our viewers, Avner has spent many years both in the IDF and 20 years of service in the Motad, that is the intelligence, Israel Intelligence Agency, uh, often abroad. Avner is experienced in dedicating his life and putting his life at risk for the sake of affirmative Zionism for the state of Israel. Avner, Tell us something about your work as a curator of the Mossad Museum and what you've done subsequently when you left the Mossad in taking this exhibition around uh, the globe, mainly in Europe and uh, America, I believe. Okay, so 11 years ago, I made uh, a small exhibit about the capture of Eichmann and uh, the Prime Minister Netanyahu asked me to come to the parliament with this uh, small exhibit. And then Tamir Pardo, uh, that was the chief of Mossad, asked me before I retired to stay three years and to build a museum for the Mossad. So I became the manager of the first Mossad ever museum. Um, I made more than 25 uh, different spy uh, exhibitions. And a few of them, uh, I got uh, permission to show a few of them uh, to the public and to show it uh, around the world. So the first one was uh, Operation uh, Finale, the capture of Eichmann, and the second was Operation Entebbe, and um, and we will talk about the raid in Entebbe and the special uh, role of Mossad and uh, spy in this uh, operation. So when I retired from the Mossad and, and when we started with the, with the COVID-19, uh, I decided to establish um, a speaker bureau. And uh, today, uh, spylegends.com is the biggest um, speakers uh, agency in Israel that deal with the uh, spy and the uh, security. Uh, we have uh, hundreds of uh, speakers from all over the world, from uh, former CIA and, and FBI and former Mossad agents, high-rank officers and professors from universities and um, producers that uh, uh, produce spy movies and, uh, and more. And uh, we have a great connections with the Jewish communities, uh, with the universities, uh, with the companies around the world and we provide not only a one Zoom event, we provide the programs about Israel, about Judaism, about the war, 
and the life in Israel. And uh, it's a great connection between uh, the Jewish people all over the world and also for the non-Jewish people that can learn about this young country that have to fight almost every day. Now, there have been a number of uh, movies uh, made about uh, this Entebbe uh, operation. Um, and uh, one of them is called Operation Thunderbolt. There have been many others as well, Operation Entebbe. But this was not just a military mission. So um, I, I want to talk to you particularly about the Mossad role behind it all. So, Abner, let's, let uh, let's set the scene and tell us about how the whole thing began. Tell us about the, the plane hijacking. Uh, where did it begin? So the whole the whole uh, story started uh, on at the at the end uh, of uh, June 1976. Um, the whole story is one week. Started from Sunday and the end when the hostages landed in Israel was exactly a week after. Um, people coming to. Uh, to the international uh, airport uh, near Tel Aviv, what we used to call Lod, today is the Ben Gurion Airport, and um, they uh, um, they wanted to fly to Paris uh, with the Air France plane. They, most of them didn't know that there is a stop in Athens, and in Athens, um, four terrorists, uh, two Arabs and two Germans, men and women, uh, get on the plane. And a uh, few minutes after the takeoff, they hijacked the plane. And uh, our story, uh, the Mossad world started because of the fact that it became international story. It wasn't inside Israel like Sabena. It wasn't a hijacked plane that landed in Tel Aviv and negotiated with the, with the IDF and all the other security forces. It was something that happened all over the world, um, and as we know, the plan continued to Libya and from Libya to Africa, to, to Uganda. And uh, in this case, the Mossad that usually don't work inside Israel, the Mossad is expert in outside Israel. That's why the Mossad needed to help. And uh, it was a, a huge part of the operation. Actually, Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin couldn't approve the operation without the special last minute uh, intelligence uh, information that the Mossad brought from uh, the airport a day before. Right, I'm going to ask you an intriguing question because quite a number of uh, viewers, people watching this video, um, have a connection with uh, Manchester. They either live in Manchester, England. They either live there or they come from there. So. What's the Manchester connection with the raid on Entebbe? Okay, so um, Patricia Mertel, that uh, grew up in Manchester and became nurse, decided to make Aliyah a few years before the, the Entebbe story. Um, she uh, started to work in a hospital, and one day the, the manager of the hospital asked her to be a personal nurse for the president of Uganda, uh, Idi Amin Dada, uh, because he used to come to, to the hospital from time to time. He was, he was a sick man. And since she could speak a perfect English, he decided that she will be uh, the secret and uh, the special nurse that take care of the president. And uh, she got married um, one, two weeks before the, the plane hijacked and her mom came from Manchester to the wedding, and then she flew back to Manchester, and suddenly she didn't feel well. They took her to the hospital, and she died there. And the bad message that uh, her mom passed away came from Manchester three days before our story started. It was Thursday, and she was religious. She decided to fly on Sunday morning, and unfortunately, she took the Air France plane uh, to Paris. But she decided when she found out that the plane hijacked, she decided that she will do everything uh, to come immediately to Manchester because the whole family waiting for her. And she injured herself and told the German woman, 
terrorist that she got a miscarriage and she need to get off the plane immediately. And she started blooding her all over and uh, the terrorists decided to let her um, go. And when they landed in Libya to refuel the plane, uh, she could go to the hospital and from the hospital um, she got uh, one night in hotel and in the morning she flew uh, to London and in London the MI6, the, um, the, the British uh, Secret Service together with Mossad agents questioned her in the airport and uh, a good friend of mine also came to Manchester to meet her in Manchester and to continue uh, ask her all the questions and he also came with a catalog with hundreds of pictures to show her and to ask her if she can try to recognize some of the faces but she was the first reliable inside information from the plan she came with the all the small details about the terrorists how many terrorists what kind of weapons and small details of all the description that you need when you enter, when you come to release the hostages, you need to know exactly uh, from the watch to the haircut, from the clothes to the color of the shoes of the terrorist. So this is actually the first uh, part of the Mossad role in the operation, the getting the information from London by questioning Patricia Merton. The plane obviously landed in Entebbe and um, they were held over there in, in Entebbe airport, protected by Idi Amin's uh, soldiers. And Idi Amin actually came to visit and view the, uh, the passengers who were being held hostage, did nothing about it. Um, but in our first video, the one about the capture of Eichmann, you referred to um, the hotel in Herzliya Pituach uh, as being a point in which uh, the relevant, the first initial relevant information was passed over to the Mossad uh, about the whereabouts of Eichmann. But I understand the same hotel has a particular connection with Idi Amin. Can you tell our viewers about that? Yes, so Hotel Hasharon, it's not far away from my studio, uh, was also the place that uh, Idi Amin Dada used to stay when he came uh, to, um, to a medical care in Israel. And uh, maybe, they have, uh, maybe they have a special rooms with uh, videos or microphone or whatever, but it looks like that this hotel is a spy hotel and all the secret uh, meetings um, was there. It's very interesting. I will try to make a research about this uh, hotel. But anyway, um, Idi Amin, when he used to come to visit the, uh, uh, the hostages, uh, he usually came with the limousine, with the black uh, limousine, uh, Mercedes, followed by two Land Rovers uh, full of uh, uh, soldiers. Ugandan soldiers with uniforms. And the uh, Sayeret Matkal, the commander unit, together with the IDF and the, and the Mossad, decided to come with the idea that if you want to approach the terminal and if you want uh, to come and to kill the terrorists and release the hostages, you need to come uh, in a way that uh, um, uh, no one will know about you only in the last second. And they decided to come with the same limousine and same two Land Rovers. So uh, the, um, they asked the Mossad to find a, 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 lim a limousine and the Mossad came with the limousine. It was a beige color. They, they needed to change the color to black and uh, they flew with the Mercedes and uh, they also needed to supply uh, Ugandan uniforms for the soldiers. So this is the story about the Mercedes, and the Mercedes is the second part of the Mossad world. 
You talking about the uh, the limousine? You shared with me a, a story of how the Mossad had to chase around uh, Israel, trying to find uh, some black spray or something in order to convert this limousine into the black color you needed before it could be sent uh, on the operation. Tell us a bit, bit of that background. So the Mossad brought the Mercedes uh, Beige and Yoni Netanyahu. It was Saturday morning, the day of the operation, before they flew to Uganda, Yoni Netanyahu asked uh, uh, one of his soldiers to go and find uh, a black spray. And uh, it was Saturday morning, no malls in Israel in the 70s, Every, everything is closed. So he decided to break the door and to enter to a paint shop and take, a, take the spray. But before he saw an uh, emergency address note, in the in the door and he decided to go to the address and to ask the owner to come and open the shop for him and he went there and he met the wife uh, she scared when she saw a soldier actually two soldiers coming to her apartment and they thought they told her it's okay we we are looking for your husband we need something it's emergency we need something from his shop and she said he's in the synagogue and they came to the synagogue and he was in the middle of praying. They took him and they said, I don't want to drive. It's a Saturday. Let's walk to the shop. And they walked together with him to the shop. He opened for them. He gave them the uh, box of spray. And uh, all the rest is history. Now, you have a very special story about two heroic pilots. Uh, one of those was basically in the service of the Mossad um, uh, and, and the other one. Can, tell us a story about the two pilots that helped uh, achieve the success in Antebi. So the first hero of uh, the pilots is uh, the, um, the captain of the Air Force uh, plane, Michel Bacos, and uh, Michel Bacos uh, there is a, a new street, a street in Natania uh, on his name. Uh, he passed away three years ago, unfortunately, but I met him uh, in Nice uh, six years ago. Um, on Tuesday, the third day, uh, the terrorists decided to make a separation between the passengers. So they opened the door between uh, the main uh, hall and the second small hall, and they said we are going to call names. They came with a table full of uh, passports, since they got all the passports, and they started calling names, but the passengers could uh, see in a few minutes that they are calling only Israelis. They just called all the people that hold Israeli passports. But they also saw uh, uh, Jews that uh, having a, a typical Jewish uh, dress like a um, Haredic uh, suit or a kippah, wearing kippah, and they also told them you have to go to the Israeli Jewish room. So they try to locate, of course, all the Israelis and all the Jews that uh, it was, um, you could see that uh, they are uh, Jewish. And uh, the captain decided that he would not uh, stay with all the foreigners. He decided that he will also go to the small room and to stay with his passengers. And that's why he was a big hero. And he, together with his team, um, you can see, by the way, this uh, scene in most of the film of the movies that uh, Hollywood made. And uh, he decided to stay. And the day after, it was uh, Wednesday and also uh, Thursday, the French government sent two different flights and she brought back all the foreign passengers. And the foreign passengers, most of them, when they landed in Paris, they met not only the, the local secret service, they also met Mossad agents, 26, Mossad agents that came immediately to the airport. Uh, most of them could speak several languages and they questioned 
most of the passengers, some, some of them refused, some of them uh, decided to cooperate. Some, some of them asked to meet uh, a day after in Paris. They questioned them and they brought the whole uh, map of uh, the, the, the airport. They came with all the small details. How many terrorists, because it was not only the four terrorists that hijacked the plane, it was also some terrorists that already uh, came before to Uganda and joined the four terrorists. Uh, so they came with all the details and you need these small details when you come to, um, to release the hostages and think about the terrorists. They don't uh, wear a uniform. Okay, and you need to find them between all the hostages. Okay, so uh, this information that came uh, from Paris allowed the IDF and the commando unit to make um, um, a successful uh, operation. And one of the uh, women that released uh, was Ninette Moreno. She was uh, a Jewish uh, with the Canadian passports. So that that's why she could. Uh, uh, joined the foreigners. Uh, she um, she got a small notebook with the black cover with a lot of uh, small details that she wrote during the few days, uh, and she uh, gave the whole information that she can remember. And we can see the the diagram that she made. And in the diagram, uh, I know it's in Hebrew, but in the diagram in the right side, you can see the main hole and the small hole and the door between them. And she decided after the operation to make uh, Aliyah and to come to Israel. And hen uh, her grandson, Emmanuel Moreno, uh, became a high rank officer in the special uh, commando uh, unit, Sayeret Matkal, and uh, uh, he uh, he took part in uh, in the ambush in uh, Lebanon and uh, killed there. And it's very symbolic the the fact that um, uh, the grandson became a high rank officer in the same unit that released the hostages in um, Uganda. So this is the third part, the uh, investigations. Uh, in Paris. Well, you've just given another example of what I uh, mentioned in the intro, uh, personal examples of affirmative Jewishness and affirmative Zionism. But tell us the story of a private pilot, an anonymous pilot, who really helped um, the uh, uh, planning. Uh, will you tell us how how this came about. What's this, what was this anonymous pilot? What did he do? Well, you can't tell us who he was, but what did he do that was exceptional? So now we are talking about Friday morning. Friday morning is one day before the operation. Uh, a special Mossad agent came from Europe. Uh, he landed in uh, Africa, in uh, Nairobi, Kenya, and he hired a small plane. He came with his small uh, Leica camera. He took off by himself and he flew to Uganda. And uh, he talked with the tower and he told the guy that he got a problem with the engine and, uh, he, and he need to land. Uh, maybe it's emergency landing. And uh, he started to make circles about the airport. And he made almost 100 pictures of all the area, aerial photos. Then he landed, he refueled the plane and talked with the staff there and uh, flew back to Kenya. And the IDF uh, sent with a special uh, plan, they sent uh, the negatives to uh, Tel Aviv. A special unit in the intelligence uh, unit in IDF uh, developed the picture, the pictures, and on Saturday, um, one big envelope with the pictures um, came to the uh, with the soldier. Uh, he gave this uh, envelope to the uh, uh, Hercules uh, staff. 
the last Hercules that took off from uh, Lod, he gave them the pictures. And after when they landed in Sharm el-Sheikh for to refuel the plane, Sharm el-Sheikh in the south of Sinai, uh, they shared all the pictures and they could see all the small details uh, from the area the day before. And in the meantime, uh, a big envelope of pictures came to the prime minister office and he was in the middle of a meeting and uh, the chief of Mossad together with uh, Mike Harari. Mike Harari is, uh, is the Israeli James Bond, we can say, Mike Harari. Uh, they showed him the pictures and he saw that there is no anti-missiles, there is no missiles. Uh, there is no uh, something that can um, destroy the program and, the, and the, something that can do to the operation. He saw that they, all the MiGs parking there, all the local MiGs that belong to the Ugandan army, and he decided also to destroy all the MiGs. It was part of the operation. <clears throat> and uh, he decided to approve the operation because of these pictures. So, so of course, the uh, the pilot, the Mossad agents that passed away, uh, unfortunately, very young. Um, he was also the second uh, hero, and and we can talk also about the other heroes, the pilots, uh, the Israeli Air Force pilots that uh, landed almost in darkness, because when they landed. Uh, the um, International Airport authorities uh, decided to turn off the lights in the runways. So um, the IDF thought about it and they came with the um, stickers and the small uh, lights and they put uh, the first plane when they landed, a few soldiers jumped from the plane and put all the stickers in the way that the other planes can use uh, to recognize the runway and to land. So uh, this is the uh, another part of uh, the Mossad. And again, it's uh, everything that related, everything that happened outside Israel is the Mossad. So coming back to the uh, Jewish passengers, the Israeli passengers are being held hostage. Um, in advance of the arrival of the Israeli uh, forces, special forces. Tell me the story of the tefillin. I have to tell our, our viewers, uh, non-Jewish viewers, the tefillin as, as a, a, a Jewish apparel that, uh, that uh, men put on their arm and on their head uh, for morning prayers. But uh, this, this tefillin, and uh, a man called Akiva Ratna has a special uh, uh, issue here that you wanted to mention. Okay, so... So actually, we have another connection to London because Akiva Laxer, if I take you four years before, on 72, he was in London. And in the same time, uh, the Munich uh, Olympic Games happened and he got a phone call from his friend, friend and he told him, uh, why don't you come to Munich? Uh, the Israeli delegation is here. And he said, no, I don't want to come to Germany. He said, no, come on. It's an Olympic Games and we have uh, Israeli delegation. It's very symbolic. So he flew to Munich and he was witness to the uh, terror uh, attack. And uh, as we remember, the terrorist killed uh, 11 uh, Israelis from the Israeli delegation. And he, he, he swear to God, even if he's uh, orthodox, he said, I swear to God that I will not let the terror win and I will fly from now on every four years to the Olympic Games. So after four years, uh, he decided to fly to Montreal. It was the Olympic Games in Montreal and uh, that's why he was in the Air Force plan because he, uh, he decided to fly from Paris. So he took the Air France, to Paris and from Paris he uh, planned to uh, fly to Montreal. So, uh, and then after four years uh, he was involved also in uh, in this uh, um, hijack plan. 
Now, since he was orthodox, he got uh, a small feeling that uh, he used to fly with uh, to different places. And uh, when uh, they called his name in the separation on Tuesday, they asked him also to open his handbag. And when they saw that feeling, they asked him, is it a communication system? And he said, yes, this is a special communication system. And I communicate with my God every morning. Um, except Saturday. So they they told him, okay, you know what? You can you can use your uh, communication system with with your God. Maybe maybe he will help you. And a long line of uh, Israelis think about them uh, praying uh, with the tefillin every morning. And it's very, it's very symbolic, you know, even me, I, I, I'm i not a religious Jew, but uh, when I'm coming to airport and I see someone from Chabad and he offered me to, to pray with the tefillin, I cannot say no, okay? But in, in the minutes that people uh, feel that they are hostages far away from home, terrorists, guns, and they became maybe closer to, to the Judaism and God and so this is the story of uh, that fill-in. And after years, he gave me the, this fill-in and uh, it was part of a special exhibit that we made in uh, Yitzhak Rabin Center in uh, Tel Aviv. And it was the first time that Benjamin Netanyahu, the brother of Jonathan Netanyahu, the prime minister, came uh, to see the exhibit and to open the exhibit. And it was a, a big success uh, uh, to join together the left side and the right side of the political map, and to see Haredi people coming to Rabin Center. And it was a huge success for the center, a huge success for the, um, to the uh, exhibit. And for me, it was great because I met hundreds of uh, visitors that each one of them came with a small piece, with a small knowledge, with the document, with the small story, pictures. And that's why, for example, we have a very rare picture from the operation. And in this picture, we can see the chief of the operation, that uh, Dan Shomron, that after years became the chief of staff. And we can see him in the middle of the picture. And this is a very rare picture made by uh, IDF uh, Air Force uh, officer and uh, uh, he came with his uh, private uh, camera and made this picture. And after 40 years, they gave me the picture. I said, now it's okay, you can have this picture because it's important for the history. Yeah, um, he, you, uh, there's another uh, thing I want to mention about Akiva uh, Laksa. Um, he gave a visiting card to uh, another man, one that was being released by the, the, the terrorist, uh, Peter Rabinovich. Tell us the story behind that. So um, when the terrorists made the separation between the Israelis and non-Israelis and Jews and non-Jews, they, uh, they continued to use the same uh, bathroom. So Akiva uh, went to the bathroom and uh, waited there to meet one of the foreigners. And when he, meet, when he met Peter, he gave him his business card and asked him to send this card uh, to Akiva's uh, parents in Tel Aviv. And uh, we all know the story that uh, after a few days, uh, Akiva landed in Israel and when he came back home, uh, after a few days, he got the uh, envelope with this card. So he got his card back. That's good. Um, on a more tragic note, tell us what you know uh, about Dora Bloch. So unfortunately, Dora Bloch, an uh, old woman that uh, um, uh, needed to go to the hospital the day before. And when she came to the hospital, um, uh, she got a, a, a small thing that uh, the doctors helped her, but they decided to let her stay in the hospital and they decided not to send her back to the uh, awful place, the, the airport. 
most of the passengers uh, became sick and uh, they got the diarrhea, for example. And uh, she stayed there. And the day after, when the Israeli forces landed, she wasn't there. She was in the in the capital in Kampala. And her son, she was with her son in the <clears throat> in Uganda. Her son stayed in the airport. And he spoke with the, one of the officers and he told them, my mom is in the hospital. And he told him, <coughs> sorry, he told him, uh, you have to fly with us back to Israel. Let's hope that they will not do anything for uh, all the women, but we cannot help her. We cannot go to the hospital and bring her. We have to uh, fly back home immediately. It's too dangerous. And therefore, unfortunately, a few days after, Idi Amin sent his animals to kill her. And uh, three years after, in a special Mossad operation, it was on 79, the Mossad could locate uh, the remains. And uh, they, uh, they came to Uganda with a small jet and they flew with the remains to Kenya. And a special uh, team from Israel, including a rabbi, checked the remains, approved that it uh, belonged to Dora Bloch, and, uh, and they flew to Israel. And it's also, uh, it shows you that uh, the Mossad and the Israeli government uh, will do everything even to find a remains of every single uh, Israeli or Jewish guy that uh, something happened to him and they will bring him home. And, and now Dora Bloch got a, a, a grave in Israel. And uh, it's important to, to mention maybe the last uh, part of uh, the Mossad role is the connection, special connection, connections with Kenya. Now, the uh, four Hercules or four C-130 planes uh, couldn't make this uh, long flight without refueling the planes. So uh, the Mossad, with the special connections with the Kenyan government, could offer the IDF to refuel the planes in Nairobi. So they landed after the operation, they flew to uh, Kenya, they refueled the planes and uh, came to Israel. And also the Kenyan government helped the Mossad to, to build a temporary field hospital uh, with the, based on tents and beds and, and, the, and the IDF sent a special Boeing built as an empty Boeing built like a hospital with uh, all the equipments that you need. And um, the, the IDF didn't need it because it was really a big, very big success. Uh, we got only uh, four people actually, together with Dora Bloch, it was four hostages that uh, killed and uh, Jonathan Netanyahu, that was the chief of the commando unit. And so the, the last part of uh, the role of Mossad in this operation is the connections in Kenya and the refueling and the hospital. And um, actually, this is the this is the story of uh, Entebbe. And it was the last time that anyone could hijack the plane. Uh, the chief of uh, the the chief of the terrorists that plan Wadi Haddad that planned this operation. Unfortunately for him, he died after a year and a half. I don't know why. Don't ask me. And after he passed away, uh, no one could continue his uh, legacy. So since Entebbe. Uh, no one could uh, do or, or hijack the uh, uh, Israeli plan. And uh, the terrorists needed to find a new way to, to act against, uh, against Israel. 
Okay, before we um, come to the uh, military operation, um, you mentioned already Haddad. Um, in the uh, Entebbe airport, the hostages were being held by terrorists, both Palestinian terrorists and German terrorists. But the chief of operations was, as you mentioned, Wadi Haddad, and this wasn't his only plane hijack, Kaki. I think he, he, he was responsible for six or seven plane hijackings. There was one big occasion in which his Palestinian terrorist uh, hijacked three planes that were flown to Jordan and then uh, blown up after the passengers uh, di uh, disembarked. Um, so uh, if you could talk a bit more about the background of Wadi Haddad, um, I, I, I noticed you said that you uh, don't want to talk about the way he died because, A, the official version was he, he died of um, some sort of disease, but there was a story that, um, that he, uh, uh, by some journalist, that he had been fed uh, Belgian chocolates. He had a, he had a healthy appetite, uh, this uh, what he had. He did, and um, he, he, he was given uh, boxes of uh, Belgian chocolates by a Palestinian who was close to him, but had been obviously in somebody's pay. Uh, and he actually died of a uh, poisoning. I don't know if you want to talk about that or you just think he was just part of a, a foreign journalist or investigative reporter. So first of all, uh, I would like to mention that uh, the reason that he decided to make the, to hijack the plane to Uganda was the fact that a few months before, uh, he tried to bomb uh, El Al plane in Kenya. And uh, the Mossad uh, found out about it, and together with the Kenyan government, they uh, stopped all the terrorists. So he wanted to release the terrorists that uh, um, were in Kenya, and he also wanted to, in the same time, to release more uh, terrorists from uh, Israel and different locations. So he asked for releasing uh, 53 terrorists, and he also uh, asked for uh, some few million dollars. Uh, so this is the reason, by the way. And, you know, it's like a circle yeah, that you try to fight the terror. But anyway, uh, you have to ask the, the journalist that wrote about the chocolate, but I can tell you um, from my experience that the Belgium chocolate, chocolate is so good that you cannot say no when someone offers you a piece of chocolate, even if you are in the middle of diet. <laughs> All right, but on a more serious note, uh, I'll stress this point to our viewers. Wadi Khadad was one of the uh, chief arch terrorists of um, PFLP, the Palestinian Front for the Liberation of Palestine. This was the group that hijacked planes. This was the group that were killing Jews and Israelis. We're giving you one example over here. Today, the PFLP is represented by so-called pro-Palestinian human rights organization as a, as a human rights organization. The PFLP, the Palestinian Front for the Liberation of Palestine, is a internationally designated terrorist organization today, and it is still alive and killing under the framework of the Palestinian Authority. That point I want to, uh, to make over. But let's come on to the actually the military campaign as much as you can uh, tell us. I was intrigued by the fact that, um, uh, that when the Israeli special forces uh, landed in their Hercules and uh, got in the, uh, the Mercedes and the Jeeps and headed for the, uh, the airport uh, lounge, the airport terminal, uh, they were wearing a white, what we call here in Israel, cover temple, a kibbutz type hat. What's the significance of that? Okay, since uh, some of the uh, commando soldiers uh, were uh, came with the wearing uh, Ugandan uh, soldiers' uh, uniform, because they came like uh, Ugandan soldiers together with the pre that coming with the president. So, <clears throat> so most of the commando uh, soldiers came with this special. Uh, a uniform and also with the red hats, um, they thought about uh, a problem that uh, 
since the, the local Ugandan army uh, was part of this uh, uh, operation, actually since the president of Uganda cooperated with the terrorists, his soldiers were there above the terminal and around the terminal. And unfortunately, the IDF needed to kill the Ugandan soldiers. Uh, so uh, they thought about the problem that uh, you, you cannot know if in the front of you it's an Israeli soldier or a Ugandan soldier. So they decided to use the white hat. It's a very typical Israeli hat. And they, they made special 200 heads, uh, 200 uh, heads like this, and they uh, share it with the uh, soldiers. And uh, actually, I have one of them in my studio, and it was also part of the exhibit. So tell us uh, briefly, in your own words, um, what happened when the uh, the lead soldiers broke into the terminal where the hostages and the terrorists were? Um, the action. What happened? How long did it take? So uh, the first uh, C-130 landed, uh, and uh, they immediately uh, start uh, to drive to the airport. Uh, the Mercedes in the front, and uh, followed by two Land Rovers. And suddenly, in the middle of the of the high, in the middle of the the way, they saw they, they saw two soldiers, two Ugandan soldiers, and uh, Yoni decided to uh, to kill them. And he tried to kill them with his gun, and they uh, uh, they opened also fired, and uh, suddenly all the other. Soldiers in the two Land Rovers started uh, uh, to uh, try to kill them also, and all the element of uh, surprise dis disappear immediately. So uh, hearing these uh, voices of uh, shooting, uh, it was the middle of night, and the terrorists and the, also the uh, hostages wake up immediately. And the terrorists uh, started to uh, uh, to wait. They thought at the beginning that it was uh, like a, a crazy local uh, soldiers that using the guns, but uh, the element of surprise disappeared, and they needed to drive immediately to the airport. And uh, in the meantime, one of the Arab terrorists. And I know this from uh, the meeting with Michel Bacos. He told me that one of the Arab terrorists came uh, to the Israeli room and he killed the first Israeli that uh, was there. It was Ida Borochovich, a woman, and he just uh, shot, shot her and killed her. And um, all the years before that uh, she uh, she died from our friendly fire, but uh, but uh, until the day that he told me that he saw the Arab terrorist killing one of the passengers. Now they enter to the uh, terminal in, in less than a minute. Uh, they could kill all the terrorists and uh, release uh, the passengers, and they start to take the passengers outside. Some of them walk to the to the empty. Hercules that already landed. Some of them uh, used the uh, jeep that uh, the Golani forces uh, used. And uh, this, this is the story of, uh, of the, uh, the, the, the terror, the, the attack, and the, the, the releasing less than a minute. And um, in the meantime, the uh, Omer Barlev, that uh, today is the Minister of uh, Inter in Interior uh, Defense, uh, he was the chief of uh, a special uh, uh, department that was in charge of uh, destroying the local uh, MiGs, the local uh, uh, Ugandan Air Force. And he uh, destroyed the, 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 all the MiGs. And uh, it was also, I believe, a part of uh, a way to help the Ugandan government, the Kenyan government, because Idi Amin was a crazy president and he was a, a big problem to most of the uh, African uh, uh, 
uh, countries in Euro in uh, Africa. And, uh, and Tebe considered uh, as one of the biggest uh, successful commando uh, operation ever. And I know that uh, there is some, for example, in India, they, they teach this operation and they learn about it. And uh, when I'm lecturing in the States, sometimes I, I see people that don't know anything about this operation that was, by the way, on the 4th of July. Uh, 76, it was exactly 200 years anniversary of the United States. And uh, I think that uh, we have to talk about this story and to show there is a lot of elements uh, in this uh, story. Because this, so, uh, this story shows that it's not only about Israelis and uh, the state of Israel, it's about uh, people all over the world fighting the terror. Um, I want you to explain to our viewers how you made peace within, within Israel. I'll, I'll explain a bit of a background to this, because at the time of you creating the exhibition uh, re regarding Entebbe, um, the political situation in Israel was pretty raw between the right and the left, between uh, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's brother, of course, Yoni Netanyahu, fell in the operation at Entebbe, and also uh, against Stephen Rabin on, on, the, on the left. Uh, but, but tell us about your uh, exhibition at the Paris Peace Center, in which I've seen a photograph of you together with both Benjamin Netanyahu and Rabin's daughter, Dalia Rabin, smiling happily at this, this event. Uh, Avner Abraham became the internal peacemaker here, it seemed. Oh, thank you for this title. I will add this title to my uh, Wikipedia. Uh, it wasn't in the Paris Center. It was in the Rabin Center in Tel Aviv. And um, as you know, there is uh, the story of, uh, of uh, killing Yitzhak Rabin. And it was uh, someone from the right side of the map, it was uh, um, something that uh, some of the people uh, saw the connection between the right side and even Benjamin Netanyahu that became after a prime minister. And it was important for me to show the exhibit in the Rabin Center. Rabin, we, we have to uh, remember, he was the, the prime minister, he was the one by, by the way, he was also the hero that uh, took the decision to approve the operation and uh, to bring the Prime Minister Netanyahu with his wife and two kids. <clears throat> and they came to the, uh, they came to see the exhibit. And I remember something that no one, maybe I will be the first one that published it, but I remember that Dalia told him, uh, you have to come and see uh, the whole museum, not only the uh, the Entebbe exhibit. And he decided to stay another hour and to see uh, the uh, the local uh, permanent uh, exhibit. And, uh, and uh, the Shin Bet needed to check everything and to make sure that it's possible. And, and he was there another hour. And uh, yes, it was a, it was a, a moment of uh, peace inside Israel, and uh, I'm I feel lucky that I was a part of it. Well, well done, Kalakabad. But also, um, you are a very creative person. Um, you designed um, medals, uh, a special commemorative uh, medallion. Uh, commemorating the Entebbe raid. Can you describe the middle to us? Uh, it's your creativity. On the one side, you have explained to us what we've got on that medal. Okay, so in, in, in this medal that uh, designed by uh, my partner, uh, Roy Segev, uh, in the right side, uh, it's actually the, the back side of the medal, uh, you can see the the Mossad role. You can see small symbols from the Mossad role in this operation. For example, you can see map of uh, uh, the UK, and uh, you can see Paris, 
uh, you can see the uh, the small jet uh, with the smoke camera and the aerial photo from the uh, airport. Uh, in the front, you can <laughs> see the tower, the tower, this the tower from uh, Entebbe Airport that still exists. You can see the four Hercules, and uh, you can see the Air France, Air France uh, Boeing uh, with the uh, MB. Uh, we decided to add MB to commemorate uh, Michel Bacot's name. And in the tower, if you look uh, at the windows, you can see four letters. It's the first letter of each one of the victims. Pasco Cohen, Jean-Jacques Maimoni, Ida Brochovic and uh, Dora Bloch in Hebrew and uh, in English. We can see also the iconic Mercedes. And uh, all the rest is, is a part of uh, the idea that you can uh, share stories with the small coin. Small coin for a big uh, operation and uh, we have a limited edition. We sell these coins. And we also um, donate it for some uh, events. And we also give it to, uh, I gave, uh, for example, this uh, medal to the Prime Minister Netanyahu. Uh, we gave this uh, medal also to Rabin's daughter. And um, we have uh, a very nice album with the picture, with the people that got this uh, special medal, if if we find the reason to, if they are part of the story. And uh, this is the story. Now the, uh, you can find everything in our website, spylegends.com. You can find also our shop. And the medal also came with a special brochure in English and Hebrew, and you can read and learn more about the operation. We have today eight different medals. Also created a medal to uh, commemorate the uh, the capture of Adolf Eichmann and to bring him back to Jerusalem for uh, justice for, for trial. That's also available in smilegels.com. So uh, viewers, um, if you're interested in learning more about um, Abner's uh, spylegends.com, uh, go to their website. Um, and uh, and if you're a head of an organization and you would want either Abner, uh, his exhibition, or any of his uh, guest speakers to come and uh, give a talk either by Zoom or personally when we get over COVID, um, how do they contact you? Do you have an email address as well, Abner? So again, if you go to info at uh, spylegends.com, you can uh, send me email. You have all the information in Spy Legends Co. Everything is there. Right, so Avner, uh, I hope many people will be in contact with you, but I can't let you go without you committing to come back on my uh, show and uh, tell us about the background of the Mossad involvement in another important uh, Israeli operation, and that was uh, Operation Diamond, in which, believe it or not, Israel managed to fly a... Uh, a new Russian MiG jet belonging to the Iraqi Air Force, if I remember right, and bring it back to Israel. So please agree to be my best, and thank you very much for being on this show. I'm sure this is going to be fascinating to many of us in our audience. Thank you, Abner. Thank you very much. I, I can't wait to the next program with you. Thank you. Well, I, I started the show by talking about the need for affirmative Jewishness and affirmative Zionism. I think this last hour that I spent now with uh, Avner has simply given you a clear demonstration of what's involved about being affirmatively Jewish, affirmatively Zionist. This is the heart of Israel. So thank you for joining me. I'm Barry Shaw, and this is The View from Israel. I'm not going to